Hello and welcome to the First and Ten Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Feltz, here in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, we're recording this just before kickoff of week four of Big Ten football. If you can believe it, we're almost halfway through the season. We're, after this week, going to be halfway through the scheduled games, not counting the conference championship week and the crossover games uh, in week nine. But we're, we're getting through this season. Uh, and along with me for the whole ride is Reed Murray. What's going on, Reed? Too much. Uh, just excited to get into another week of Big Ten football. Obviously, disappointed that the Ohio State game isn't going to happen, but hey, it happens. Uh, that's just what the world is like when there's COVID. So uh, we'll move on, but still excited to see some Big Ten football. Right. And it, it's rough to not see that Ohio State Maryland game. I think that could have taught us a lot about Maryland uh, and their start, if it's legit or not, if they could hang with Ohio State. Uh, probably not beat them, but hang with them at least, maybe look competitive. Uh, but you know, uh, Ohio State, I think, is going to be okay without this game against Maryland. And honestly, it benefits them a little bit because they get two weeks to prepare for uh, what could be their biggest test of the season in Indiana. Yeah. Um, and I think that with Maryland, although they looked impressive last week and beating Penn State is a really huge thing to do, I think they're pretty overhyped. They had one really good win, which was last week. But I think a lot of people talking about how Ohio State's lucky this game didn't happen and how Maryland would have shocked the world. I, I'm not buying it. I think they're they're lucky to not play it for a different reason, and that's just that they get to prep more for Indiana, which is going to be their biggest game yeah. of the season, besides maybe the Big Ten Championship if they draw Wisconsin or Northwestern or even Purdue or whoever. We've got a Big Ten West Championship game potentially this weekend, uh, depending on how things shake out. But before we get into any of that, uh, last night, uh, if you're watching this or listening to it on Friday, uh, me and Reed's NFL teams played. The Indianapolis Colts played the Tennessee Titans. You see the Colts flag. You see the Colts shirt. Uh, excuse me for a second. If you're watching on YouTube, you see the Colts mask. You see the Baltimore Colts hat. And I've also got the Colts beanie on top of it all. Colts beat the Titans last night. How are we feeling, Reed? Well, if you look at me, I got on a black jacket and a gray hoodie because I don't worship my team like a cult. But uh, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. You know, it's one game. We're both we're, both teams are still over 500. It is what it is. Also, the Indianapolis Colts, baby. I don't care. Uh, we are in first place in the division. Colts are looking great. Uh, and the Titans got doubled up last night by Phillip Rivers. Uh, needless to say. I'm feeling pretty great, and I'm ready to get into some Big Ten football games. I don't know about you. I am, too. Ready to move on from the NFL. Me, too. I, uh, I'm i ready. Uh, but let's talk about this first uh, Big Ten football game. And you might wish we were talking about the NFL after we talk about it. Illinois at Rutgers. Uh, this one could be terrible. Uh, there's a good chance that it's at least unwatchable, at a bare minimum unwatchable. 12 o'clock on Big Ten Network. Rutgers favored in a conference game for the first time in – forever <laughs> uh it's crazy to see but Rutgers is a home favorite here against Illinois uh no Brandon Peters Illinois still dealing with some COVID issues of their own uh, and Rutgers has looked competitive they've got a conference win over Michigan State uh which looks less and less impressive week after week but nonetheless Rutgers has won a conference game and I think they should pretty much be expected to win this one too with the way Illinois has looked you know this has been the Big Ten toilet bowl for years but now one of the teams is actually kind of good, which is kind of odd. And I think this could be a good test to figure out how good Rutgers is, as odd as that may seem, considering that Illinois is the worst team in the Big Ten. But it's it's just like what I said with the Minnesota-Maryland game last season when Minnesota was, I think, about five or five or six and zero, oh, And I was like, well, we're going to see how good Minnesota is by if they can blow out one of these teams like Maryland that they're supposed to blow out. Illinois is a team who whoever plays them, they should get blown out every week. So if Rutgers can win by a score of somewhere between 30 and 40 points, then maybe we got to start taking them seriously. But I think Rutgers is a little overhyped. They had a good win against Michigan State, but it really had to come down. It was just because Michigan State is awful at football. And then they had they put up a good fight against Indiana. They looked all right against Ohio State. But I think everyone's getting a little too far ahead of themselves with Rutgers. I still think they win big in this one, but I don't think Rutgers is the team that a lot of people think they are. I think Rutgers is on the track to being back. I don't think they're officially here or back or anything, but they're respectable nowadays, which you couldn't say about the Chris Ash 
uh, Coach Drucker's teams. Greg Schiano has brought this team to respectability, and a respectable team is going to get it done against an Illinois team that's not only dealing with COVID problems of their own, but is also just not that good at football. Uh, and I think they get it done, especially at home. Uh, Illinois is just bad. <laughs> they're, they're bad, and I thought they were going to be okay. I thought every team in the West was going to be okay. Illinois is bad. They're just a bad football team. Uh, and I'm not excited to say it, but especially with COVID dealing, uh, taking out their starting quarterback and their backup quarterback, uh, it's easy to say that Illinois is a bad team and pretty much a runaway favorite for worse in the Big Ten. I've got Rutgers winning this game 31-10. I have a similar score, but I have Illinois scoring a lot more points. I think Rutgers still gets a lot of points on the board. I think Bo Melton and Eric Kirkshank are going to have a field day against this Illinois defense. But I got Rutgers 35-23. I think Illinois uh, gets some points here and there, similarly to how they did against Purdue. Yeah, this Illinois defense, uh, they, they did play a good game against Purdue, but, uh, you know, the Purdue offense has struggled at points, although they are undefeated. They're 2-0. and uh, You can kind of put some asterisks next to those wins, though they haven't looked amazing on offense. It's not like they're torching teams. They're squeaking by, but uh, they, they put the clamps down on Purdue in that uh, fourth quarter, and they almost came back to win it. Uh, but the thing is, they gave up a ton of points to, to Wisconsin and a ton of points to an awful Minnesota team. Uh, you can thank Mo Ibrahim for that. But I think Rutgers is better than Minnesota. So I think Rutgers should handle them even more so than Minnesota handled them. I think that's, I don't know. I can't quite say that yet because there's still a lot of question marks. We don't really know how good Maryland is. Obviously, we would have found out uh, or had at least a much better idea if they had played Ohio State this week. So I think Rutgers and Minnesota are in a similar ballpark. Obviously, Minnesota, we thought they were going to be much better. And now that uh, their passing offense isn't doing anything, we think uh, much worse of them. But I think part of the reason that we might be seeing, oh, we think Rutgers is a better team than Minnesota, is because we had expectations for Minnesota and we had rock bottom expectations for Rutgers. So I think it's a little too early to, to have a lot of separation between these two teams. And I think this game is closer than the Minnesota game. I think this Illinois offense will be able to get something done. Like I said, against Purdue, they clawed their way back into that game. I think they do something similar here. And I think this game will actually play out similar to the Purdue game. Rutgers gets a sizable lead early and then Illinois tries to come back, but ultimately they just don't have the firepower to do so. I can see that happening too. I would, I would say that Rutgers is just a far and away better football team though. And they're better coached. I think that's they're absolutely better coached. And yeah, I think they're. By the, by the way, a uh, fun little wrinkle here. Uh, these two men, uh, these two head coaches, Lovey Smith and Greg Schiano, both former Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coaches. Wow. I didn't know that Schiano coached the Bucs. I knew that Lovey Smith did, but uh, that is news to me. Yeah, he did. He, he coached the Bucs. Uh, I'm looking at the, the timeline. Uh, he coached them until 2013. He was fired in 2013. And I believe Lovey Smith succeeded him immediately, uh, actually, as the coach of the Bucs. But obviously, neither of them lasted too long in Tampa. Uh, now it's Bruce Arians' team. But uh, the, the Bucs, or the Bucs, uh, uh, the Scarlet Knights are Rutgers. They got Shiano back. He's their man. And I think he brings them another conference victory. I think so too. How odd is it that we live in a year where Rutgers gets two conference wins? That might be the strangest thing in 2020. They might even get more for all we know. True. I think they can beat Michigan. Um, I, I think it's possible they beat Maryland because like I said, Maryland's still a question mark. We don't know. So uh, definitely got to keep an eye out for a potentially four and four Rutgers team. Strange as it is to say that. It's possible. I think Rutgers – there's a pretty good chance they go bowling. And who thought that at the beginning of the season, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to see Rutgers in a bowl game. But when you consider how many of these bowl games are getting canceled, um, they might unfortunately get screwed out of one because of that. And, you know, one possibility I've seen thrown around with all these bowl games getting canceled left and right and, you know, so many teams, maybe three and five, who won't get selected for a bowl game, who think, oh, we, we had a better season than that, we should go bowling. Could, could teams host their own postseason games at home? Like, let's say Nebraska doesn't go bowling and UCLA doesn't go bowling. Both of those teams miss the cut. They don't get selected for a bowl game. What if Nebraska calls UCLA and it's like, hey, let's play a game in Lincoln. We'll call it our postseason game. You think that could happen? It's probably possible. I mean, there's, there's probably got to be some sort of rule within the Big Ten that 
uh, prohibits that or because otherwise, why wouldn't we have seen that before, you know, so maybe there, there's probably some sort of rule against it. But if there's not, we might see that this year. We might actually see that a few years from now um, in the future, say a team like UCLA and Nebraska goes five and seven, then, you know, what's keeping you from if you're legally allowed to, if the NCAA allows you to, why not? So that might actually be something that we see this season and later on. Well, if it's allowed this year, I think the excuse is COVID year. So you can do whatever you want. You want to play as many games as you can get that revenue, right? Cause you're losing a lot of revenue without ticket sales, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, COVID year is a good excuse for anything. I think you can say, Oh, we only did it because it was the COVID year and a lot of bowl games got canceled. So uh, but if that, that does work out well and they get TV revenue, ticket revenue, they might extend that in the future. And, and think about this too. Um, if it's a, essentially exhibition game between let's say Nebraska and UCLA for the sake of the example, then that's not a big 10. That's not an official big 10 game. So the big 10's rules about uh, crowds and things like that won't be in effect. So we might see teams having like teams like Nebraska having limited capacity, or we might see them uh, break rules and have sort of dangerous crowds, which is actually kind of a scary scenario to picture, but we might see some different uh, crowd situations when it comes to bowl games. Right. Yeah. The bowl games are not under big 10 rules. Like if you're playing an sec team, but sec teams have fans there every single week. So uh, for all, you know, you could be playing in a, a, a crowd, which I think a lot of big 10 fans will travel for that too. But uh, who knows if that's safe or not really. Uh, you'd, you'd have to see, you'd have to see how it's done, but. Uh, odds are I think it, that could happen and that's totally a thing that could happen it all depends on local and state ordinances I think and those places where the games are going to be happening yeah it's a similar situation to that Nebraska what was it UT Chattanooga we were talking about a few weeks ago where it's not under the Big Ten's jurisdiction so it's it's, it's all kinds of crazy scenarios that could happen in this postseason yeah uh, who knows uh, that that could be a thing uh, I haven't heard anything debunking it but as of now, that's not on the table, the scheduling your own postseason games just because you want to, but totally possible, I, as far as I know. For all I know, it's against the uh, NCAA rules or something, but I think it could happen, potentially. It's on the table. Anyway, let's move on to our next game. Uh, so the next game is the, uh, the game between uh, two teams who I said – it's really a loser leaves town match. Uh, the loser of this game, I think their season is all but over. If it's not already, Penn State at Nebraska in Lincoln. Uh, Penn State 0-3, Nebraska 0-2. These teams uh, look like they could be on a downward spiral real quick. You're right. Penn State, they need a win and they need it badly. Nebraska does too, but I think Penn State – this is an absolute must win if there ever was one for them because we thought that last week was a must win against Maryland. Then they went and lost that one. So the emotions in this game for Penn state are probably gonna be off the chart and that alone um, that might surge them to victory, just needing a win. And the fact that they have four and five stars to do it. But one thing to keep an eye on in this game is the Penn state D line because Adrian Martinez, while he is a dual threat quarterback, he doesn't seem to deal with pressure very well, especially when he's trying to pass the ball. So this could be a major limiting factor for the Huskers. So Penn State's D-line game in this uh, matchup going to be crucial. Uh, yeah, I think so too. But another thing is Penn State is going to be motivated. Uh, they got the news earlier this week that Journey Brown is done with football forever. Uh, we talked in the preseason about how there were rumors and rumblings on Penn State message boards and stuff about how it looks like Journey Brown could miss the season. And we're like, wow. Well, first it was, he could miss the Indiana game and the Ohio state game. And we're like, wow, that would be a huge loss for Penn state. Hopefully it's nothing serious. And then it became, he could miss the season. And now he's never playing another snap of football. And that is just so, so sad for a player who was incredibly talented. And I just hope that these hard issues he has uh, don't, don't shorten his life and don't uh, hurt him any more than not being able to play the game he loves does. And I, I hope he, stays involved in the game as much as he wants to, as much as he can, uh, and is healthy and happy, gets his degree, all that. Uh, we are wishing nothing but the best for Journey Brown. Absolutely. It's a horrible situation. And, you know, like you said, we thought it was bad when he was going to be out for a few games or potentially this season. Now he's out forever. Um, we feel truly sorry for Journey Brown. Um, but 
back to this game, Sean Clifford, once again, he is going to have to be a crucial player in this game because he needs to be able to pass the ball. He has been having a rough three weeks. Um, and passing the ball is how Ohio State put points to the board against Nebraska. Um, their run game was okay, but Nebraska just could not defend that passing at all, especially when you got a guy like Jahan Dotson to throw it to. Passing the ball effectively has to be a number one priority for this Penn State offense. Um, and we saw that um, last week when Northwestern faced Nebraska, Peyton Ramsey looked good passing the ball as well. So you need to have an effective passing offense when facing Nebraska. Um, I think they can do it because although Sean Clifford has looked disappointing, he's still Sean Clifford and this is still a lackluster Nebraska defense. So he should be able to pass the ball with relative effectiveness. Um, and like I said, especially when we have Jahan Dotson, but if not, Penn State could be in some serious trouble. Yeah, uh, and Penn State already is in serious trouble. Starting 0-3 is nothing to uh, to scoff at. That is huge. I think that is a, a disappointment to say the least. But, uh, Reed, do you think that this start is sensing a broader pattern for Penn State this season? Do you think that it's possible that they miss out on a bowl game? Certainly a possibility. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, you look at their schedule, they still got to face Michigan, and although Michigan's having a down year, so is Penn State. So that game, you could call a toss up. They still got to face Rutgers, who's similar to Maryland. They're a team who has been poor the last five years or so, and now they're looking better. So that's a potential loss. They have Nebraska this week. Once again, Nebraska not looking great this year, but it's not impossible to lose the game after, especially after going and losing to Maryland. So it's absolutely a possibility. I think Penn State finishes the season strong. I think this is um, a wake-up call, and it's hard to say that 0-3 is a wake-up call because you'd think they'd be woken up after uh, the first one or two weeks. But regardless, I think they finished season five and three. I got them going to the Duke's Mayo Bowl, which is hilarious <laughs> to say. And it's also funny to picture Penn State having played in the Cotton Bowl last year, now playing in the Mayo Bowl. But uh, anyway, I think Penn State turns it around. And although I don't love James Franklin as a coach, um, he's still – He's an objectively good coach, and I think he'll be able to bring his team out of this. I mean, he brought Penn State. He took them out of their darkest years that they've ever had. So I think Penn State has the potential to, to at least go bowling. I think they're going to go bowling too. Uh, whether it's a good bowl or not, who knows? Uh, probably not a, not a great bowl. Obviously, they're not going to a New Year's Six again. But uh, whether it's even a respectable bowl, whether they're you know the pinstripe bowl or – uh, the, the Detroit Bowl is happening this year, right? Or is that canceled? I heard it wasn't. It's canceled? But okay, I thought it that's was. That's what I heard. I'm not 100% sure on that, so do not I've heard. Me. I've heard rumblings that the, the Detroit Bowl was canceled, but, you know, something like that, a, a crappy bowl game that you don't want to go to, like the the jokes of bowl games that, that these teams go to that uh, that nobody cares about, nobody watches, have that you've been able to social distance at in the stands forever, let's just say. But uh, – <laughs> uh, and that's going to be weird uh, just seeing Penn State in that situation and seeing him in the situation of 0-3. Uh, it's weird and it's bad. And I think it's an awful sign because I don't see this program uh, getting back to 10-2 uh, and 2 next season or season after that just doesn't feel like it's going to happen. I, uh, I'm not confident uh, that they are keeping up with the rest of the Big Ten East because Indiana's turning it around. Maryland's turning around. Rutgers is turning it around. Ohio State is the best team in the country. Michigan and Michigan State are down, but when when you're fifth in the Big Ten East, that's not great, especially when you're Penn State. Now, I don't agree with that. I don't think this is going to carry on to the next two years. I think they're going to be right back at, at that 9-3, and 10-2 and two spot where they're a great team but not elite, which is – that's what I said the problem with James Franklin is he's always going to have them be a good or great team but never elite. I think they get right back to that spot, but they're going to build themselves up uh, in the next year or the year after that, get back to that second in the Big Ten East spot, and they're just going to stay there like they have the last few years. That's my prediction as to what's going to happen. And although the rest of the Big Ten East is growing, I just cannot imagine Penn State falling off. I can see Michigan falling off. They've done it before. And obviously Penn State has fallen off before. They had the whole uh, bull ban situation where they had a, a few rough years. But I think under James Franklin, Penn State figures a way out to at least go 9-3 um, consistently. I don't think they're going to be back to second in the Big Ten East consistently. I think Indiana is just a better program, and Indiana is stronger, and Indiana is deeper. Indiana is better for the near future, and I think for the long-term future, I think Indiana is better than Penn State. I think that's 
I think that's a hard statement to make. Right now, they're a better team, um, but we're still talking about we're talking about a team who's on the rise compared to a national powerhouse. And although the national powerhouse is going uh, not in the direction they want to go, it's still Penn State. You still have James Franklin, who I hate to say it, he's a great recruiter. So you're still going to be getting these top recruits coming in. I think you at least have to say that Penn State's going to be third in the Big Ten East uh, if Indiana surpasses them for a few years. But I don't think Indiana's going to become a powerhouse in the next decade. Well, with what you've seen from Maryland, too, uh, if, if this Maryland, Maryland's been recruiting incredibly well. Uh, and with Tagovailoa and, and even Rakim Jarrett on the team right now, you've got three more years of those guys. I don't think Penn State's got a player as talented as either of those two. Well, Especially let's be clear. I mean, Tiger Hilo and Rakim Jarrett, they're not going to be playing all of their college years. They're going to finish the season and play two more years and be gone. Well, yeah, three more this year and two more. But uh, Oh, I could have been. Yeah, yeah. So junior. after their junior years, basically. Uh, I think I think with, with Penn State, though, uh, you can attribute a lot of this season, though, to no journey Brown, who unfortunately is never going to play another down of football. And that is just so, so sad, but uh, to know Micah Parsons too, I think their defense has really fallen apart without him. He was the heart and soul of the team, best linebacker in the country. Uh, not having him is going to obviously change the outcome of your, your whole season, but to the point of where you're starting 0 three, it seems like you've got bigger issues than just missing out on those two guys. I agree with that to an extent, but I think still, when you look at this team, Guys like Micah Parsons come through this program and there's going to be another Micah Parsons soon. So I think Penn State, I mean, like I said, they're a powerhouse. They're a team who's, who's built to be able to rebuild. That's that's in their foundation. They have top recruits coming in year in, year out. So I just can't imagine going back into this hole where they were at around 2013 or so. I don't know about a hole. I don't know if they're going to drop that far, but you know, I think they'll still be a respectable team year in and year out, but uh, to the point of where I think they're going to a New Year's Six Bowl or where that's the expectation every year. I don't know. I think that might be more of an anomaly than a commonality in Penn State football going forward. All right. Well, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree on that one. We'll see what the future holds on that one. Uh, we'll see which of these takes ages better and which one ages like milk. Uh, but for this weekend, I think Penn State wins, and I think they win 35-21. to 21. Yeah, this week I have Penn State. Um, I got him winning this one 31 to 20. Okay. Uh, so very similar scores from the two of us there. Uh, you can watch this game uh, this Saturday at noon. Uh, and that game will be on Fox Sports 1. Uh, the other noon game in the Big Ten, number 10. That's right. Number 10, Indiana heading to Michigan State, the Battle of the Old Brass Platoon. Uh, Hoosiers last won the Spittoon in 2016 uh, and uh, Penn State or Penn State. Look at me. Michigan State has held the Spittoon for the last three years, including a uh, pretty close win last year in East Lansing. Hoosiers head back to East Lansing this year uh, to try and bring back the trophy to Bloomington. Indiana is the far and away better team. I think they're better on paper. They're better on the field. Uh, and they match up well with, with Michigan State. Michigan State's a pass-heavy team, can't run the ball well. Indiana's got great defensive backs, so they can kind of hold them down. Yet this still kind of feels like a trap game. I see what you're saying. And, you know, you're talking about number 10 Indiana. Patrick, I know you know this, and some of our listeners um, who listen to, I believe we talked about this in the mailbag episode or at some point over the summer, um, you might know that I like to play NCAA 14. That is one of my favorite games. Um and I used to have a dynasty on NCAA 14 where I took the Kansas Jayhawks and I brought them to the Cotton Bowl. They, I had them ranked at about number 10. This feels just like that. It's kind of bizarre. It feels like it's a video game when you take one of these programs who's struggled historically and now they're in the top 10. Now they're being in, in consideration for New Year's six games. Um, if you want to get really crazy, they're in consideration for the playoff. This is wild and it doesn't feel real, which is part of why this might be a scare for Indiana. It, it almost feels surreal that they're going into this game against Michigan State. Um, although the betting lines aren't crazy, I mean, most people would feel pretty confident Indiana gets a win, which is something you couldn't say last year. Indiana, they have expectations. They have a high ranking. So we've talked about in the past, how does Indiana handle success? So far, they've done it well. They came off a win against Penn State, uh, and they beat Rutgers, although close in, or in the beginning of the game. They still won relatively comfortably. Then they had more expectations going into the Michigan game and they blew the doors off of them. So they've held success 
well so far. Can they continue that? That's the big question going into Saturday. Yeah, and that's the thing is they they are just a much better team than Penn State. Or damn it, I did it again. Than Michigan <laughs> State this season. Uh, I think they're a better team than Penn State too, but uh, they are a better team than Michigan State. I don't think there's any doubt about that uh, after what Indiana did to Michigan uh, and what we saw Michigan State even do to Michigan. Uh, looking at the tape on both of those games, Indiana matches up well with Michigan State. They can do things that Michigan couldn't, uh, which is – defend the pass. Uh, Michigan can't defend the pass. Iowa defended the pass and Iowa ran the ball down Michigan State's throats. That run defense is bad. Uh, you'd have to expect a big Stevie Scott game today. He hasn't really been prone for many big games this season. He's, he's gotten the touchdowns when he's needed to, but uh, this has not been a run heavy team whatsoever. This has been a very pass heavy team. A lot of Ty Fry Fogel, a lot of Watt Fillier. Uh, Indiana's going to have to rely on the run game a lot more, I think, this week because Penn, or again, Michigan State is just so bad in that run defense. Yeah, I love the idea of a big Stevie Scott game. I'm a big fan of Stevie Scott. I also want to see Samson James do a little something special here in this game. But, you know, while we're on the topic of this potentially being an upset, there are signs. Like I said, Indiana, they've handled success poorly in the last few years. They've done it well this year, but uh, it's it's tough to handle success, whether you're Indiana or any team um, who's having a – total breakout year it's hard to handle it and Michigan State obviously they can upset somebody they did, they did it against Michigan um, but the problem is when you get up for a rivalry game like the Michigan one there's just all kinds of different emotions going into it and while this is a trophy game I mean this isn't a serious uh, rivalry or no kind of hatred or emotions going into this one this trophy's so, a little bit funny yeah all, all of that uh, all that emotions and all everything that you've got going into a game against Michigan where you're playing for such important bragging rights in your state, that's just not there for this game. So the intangibles are completely different here. So that's going, that's not really in the Spartans' favor. Um, and Rocky Lombardi played the game of his life against Michigan, and I just don't think he can replicate that performance. I don't think this entire Michigan State team um, has it in the tank to pull off an upset this big, especially when Indiana's looked so good so far. Um, but especially when you consider their quarterback is not very good. He had a great game against Michigan, and then he had a horrible performance against Iowa. And I, I just don't think he can pull it off. And I think Indiana, they're going to they're gonna look like they want to give this game away. This is going to be a game where I don't think Indiana is going to be totally on top of the game. Michigan State just doesn't have what it takes to take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I think I don't think this is going to be like like the Michigan game where Indiana just manhandles them from start to finish. I think this is going to make Hoosier fans sweat a little bit more like the Rutgers game. Uh, maybe not to the point of where I think for parts of the game, like, oh, man, I think we could lose this. But to the point of where, why is this so close? Iowa beat them by 42. Why is this so close? Uh, makes you sweat a little bit because for the first time <laughs> maybe ever, uh, Indiana is not – the team playing the top 10 team with a chance of setting up a trap game and getting an upset. They're the top 10 team in the trap game who might get upset. And it's weird. You're right about that. And um, another thing is it would take almost a perfect game for Michigan state to win here. Like I was saying in the past about you need a perfect game to beat Ohio state. You need to be on for all 60 minutes of football. That's exactly how this one goes because Michigan state, they just aren't as talented as Indiana at every position on the field. So they need to be spot on every single snap. And like I said, I just can't imagine that happening. I think Indiana keeps it way too close for comfort, but they'll eventually win this one 28 to seven. I like Indiana 42, 42 to 17. I think it's close for three quarters. And then in the fourth quarter, uh, I think the play calling gets a little better. IU decides, screw it, let's throw the ball. They start throwing the ball and it works and uh, they put some points on the board. I like the Hoosiers, 42-17. I, have, I, I agree with you on, on that it's close early. I think going into the halftime, it'll be something like 10-7. to 7. I just don't think either team is going to be able to move the ball super well offensively early in this game, which is why I think it's going to be a much lower score. Yeah, I like the higher score just because I think the Hoosiers will figure it out eventually and the talent will just win out. And, uh, you know, having Michigan State score 17 might even be a little high after what we saw from them against Iowa last week, but I could see a special teams touchdown. I could see a fumble recovery. I, I could see something like that happening. And I do think they'll drive down the field and get a touchdown at some point in the game. It's it's hard to not see them doing that. Uh, 
you know, even just given the way they played against Michigan, like a team like that is not going to not score a touchdown in a game. That's kind of crazy to think. They scored a touchdown last week against Iowa, and they played about as bad of a game as you could ever play. So regardless, I think the Hoosiers are better, and I think the Hoosiers get it done. Uh, hopefully they're undefeated going into that matchup in the shoe. Yeah, that's going to be a huge game. That's game of the year for both teams. You got to say you could call that the Big Ten East Championship. Um, all eyes got to be on that one. Yeah, uh, big game next week. Uh, could be a matchup of the undefeated. Ohio State will be undefeated because they're not playing this week. Indiana could be undefeated if they can get it done and bring the old brass platoon back to Bloomington. That game will be on ABC at noon. The next game, uh, this is a weird start time, 5 o'clock on the Big Ten Network. Never seen a 5 o'clock kick before, but uh, 5 o'clock on the Big Ten Network, Northwestern and Purdue. Uh, no 3.30 games in the Big Ten this week, which uh, I think is weird. I uh, gives you a nice little break in your afternoon, though, for you Big Ten fans. But uh, Northwestern, number 23 in the country, headed to ross Aid Stadium to take on the Purdue Boilermakers. That's on BTN at 5 p.m. Uh, Northwestern's looked great so far this season, and Purdue has been shaky at points, but they're undefeated. This is a matchup of the undefeated, and there's a chance that this could decide the Big Ten East or Big Ten West crown uh because if wisconsin misses one more game due to covid they're done and they cannot win the big 10 east championship west excuse me i I keep messing up man uh they can't win the big 10 west if they miss another game due to covid but uh northwestern looks to be in the driver's seat and if they win out obviously they'll win the division uh they've got purdue this week they've got northwestern and wisconsin uh next week uh which if this game against purdue is not the Big Ten West title, then it'll be the Northwestern Wisconsin game. So uh, Purdue dodged Wisconsin. Purdue did not have to play the Badgers because the Badgers were still dealing with COVID. And, you know, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing for Purdue. I saw some people saying it's a good thing because uh, Wisconsin is just a better team than Purdue, which I agree with. I think Wisconsin's a much better team. They have a better defense, uh, better offensive line. Uh, but the difference is, I don't think Graham Mertz would have been playing for Wisconsin. So if you could get a win against Wisconsin, send Wisconsin – uh, a game into the loss column, which is probably going to be a rare sight for them this season, uh, assuming Mertz is back and everything looks good like it did that week one game against Illinois. Uh, and that's big for Purdue to get a leg up in the Big Ten standings and not getting to play that game could hurt them, I think, in the long run. And this Northwestern game against Purdue, if this isn't your Big Ten West championship, it will at the very least have big implications. Um, Certainly. Obviously, I think the winner of this game um, – it's, it's going to come down to the winner of this game in Wisconsin. So this game, huge implications, whether it does ultimately end up deciding the West or not. Um, and at first, this game kind of seems like a no-brainer. you got a team with a great defense and a good offense facing a team with a great offense and a bad defense. You would think the team who has, like, say, an, an A defense and a B offense beats the team who has an A um, offense and a maybe C or D defense. But I just have a feeling that Purdue wins an ugly game here. I got a feeling they just find a way to win somehow like they have the last two weeks, and I don't like it. The problem with that, though, is Purdue's offense is heavily reliant on David Bell and Milton Wright. Um, So at this point, Purdue is going to have to try and win this game um, through the air. And to do that, they got to beat one of the best secondaries in the FBS. That's no easy task. So you have two options. We either continue to pass the ball with some effectiveness, but not great, um, and try to get enough yards and enough points to win this game with an okay quarterback, Aiden O'Connell, who's definitely going to throw at least one interception. I would actually say he's going to throw probably two interceptions against Northwestern. Um, So you risk it passing the ball, or you try to run it with Xander Horvath, who's good on an offense like Purdue where he gets touches here and there and he picks up good yardage but not really good enough to carry his team to victory against the defense like the Wildcats. Either option, I don't think Purdue's offense is going to be good enough to get over the hump of Northwestern, and I think Northwestern comes away with a win. I think Northwestern wins it too, but my reason is this. Purdue has three elite talents on their team, three guys who would start for any team in the country and are probably going to be first-round NFL draft picks. Rondell Moore, George Karloftis, David Bell. Rondell Moore is probably not going to play, and the team has been super cryptic about his injury. I'd be kind of surprised if he plays all season. George Karloftis isn't playing this week. He got hurt against Illinois. He's in rehab. Uh, It's looking, well, 
Purdue's been very cryptic about injuries just in general, uh, but they've certainly been cryptic about the Moore injury and with Karloftis too. Uh, uh, Brom did not say if he would play or not against Illinois, or he got hurt against Illinois, excuse me, against Northwestern. Uh, I'm kind of thinking that he's not going to play against this Northwestern team, though. Uh, it's kind of seems like Karloftis is out, Bell's out, or Bell's in, but Moore's out. I don't like that. I think Purdue's pass rush falls apart without Karloftis, and uh, with with Rondell Moore out, it is the David Bell show. Uh, and while David Bell doing everything he can <laughs> – uh, was enough against Iowa, and it was enough against Illinois. Northwestern's defensive backs are some of the best in the country, and I would say they're second or third best in the conference, certainly behind Indiana and maybe behind Ohio State. Uh, Northwestern's defensive backs are incredible, and they're going to give everything they can on David Bell. And I think if there's any team in the country that can lock him down, it's Northwestern. I've got the Wildcats here, 24 to 14. I agree with you on that. Um, and let me make one thing clear here. Peyton Ramsey is more than good enough to flat out make a fool out of Purdue's defense. I mean, you just look at last year's stat from stat line from the old Oaken bucket game. He had 23 completions on 39 attempts, three touchdowns, zero interceptions, 337 yards in the air and 42 yards on the ground. Now he's going against the Purdue defense who's overall bad. And they're only really strong unit on the defense, the D line, which is missing. Like we said, George Karloftis. So he has a huge leg up in this one. Um, already being a good enough quarterback to at least do a job in this game. Now he might actually put up some really good numbers um, and really just embarrass this Purdue defense. Another player I want to uh, see shine in this game is Wildcats running back Drake Anderson, who looked good against Nebraska last week. Um, and now he's playing a similar defense in Purdue. So I expect to see something out of him on Saturday. I hope he puts up some good numbers and I'm really rooting for that guy. I got the Northwestern Wildcats 27 to 20, because although I think they are the better team and everything is pointing their favor, like I said, Purdue just finds some kind of way to keep it close. Um, if, if this Northwestern team was slightly worse, I think they'd find a way to win an ugly game. But I think, like you said uh, about the Indiana game, I think in this game, it applies the same way. Talent just wins out and Northwestern is the overall better team. I agree. We've got the cats here. Uh, you can catch that game on Big Ten Network at 5 o'clock. Really weird kickoff time, like we said. Uh, last game of Saturday before we get into the Friday night special, which is going to be our last game. Uh, Saturday night football, Wisconsin at Michigan, the number 13 ranked Badgers are back after a two-week COVID hiatus. Uh, we haven't seen them since week one, their week one win over Illinois in Madison, 45-7. to uh, Question, though, is if Graham Mertz is going to be on the field or not. That's still kind of an unknown read. What do you think about Mertz? I think he's not playing because uh, isn't I mean this is a 21 day COVID protocol, and he tested positive what on, on the Sunday after. I'm Illinois I'm really certain the test was given though that Saturday, so I think it was exactly 21 days ago. I don't know if that means he'll play or not. I have not heard about Mertz's status. Uh, I think there's two very different outcomes for this game. If Graham Mertz is on the field, uh, I think Wisconsin shreds Michigan. I think they just crush them because Michigan's defensive backs are awful and Wisconsin is a pass heavy team as weird as that is to say I think Wisconsin wins it like 42 to 20 more or less uh maybe I'd say Wisconsin would win this game uh 45 to 21 but uh let's say Graham Mertz doesn't play I think Michigan can win this game because I don't see Danny Vandenboom beating Michigan so in this game, I'm going to go ahead and operate under the assumption that Graham Mertz is not playing. Um, I think even if he is back after that 21-day um, protocol has expired, he still hasn't practiced going into this week. Um, so Wisconsin has been practicing this entire time with Danny Vandenboom, a quarterback. So I think they're going to go with the guy who's uh, been practicing with him, been preparing. So this game with no Graham Mertz is going to be ugly. Here's why. Wisconsin runs an air raid under Graham Mertz, and Mertz, in this scenario we're talking about, isn't playing. So maybe Vandenboom will be able to pass the ball well against Michigan's abysmal DBs, but you really can't count on a fourth stringer too much. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that this Wisconsin pass offense isn't going to be able to do much. Um, they're going to be forced to run the ball with Garrett Groshek and Nikia Watson, and they'll be okay. They'll help uh, Wisconsin put together a few drives, but – these running backs aren't really exceedingly good and the Michigan defense stops the run much better than they do the pass. So the, the run game, it won't be doing enough for them to completely put this game out of sight. 
And when it comes to the Michigan offense, they're going to make, they're going to get going up against, excuse me, a Wisconsin defense who is solid. They have experience. And now Joe Milton, who's played, who started for three weeks in his college career um, is going to have to play probably the best defense he's played so far, or you could maybe make the case that that's going to be Indiana um, who has the strongest defense uh, on Michigan's schedule so far. But either way, going up against, against a strong, experienced unit, he's going to have a few hot moments throughout the game, maybe hit a deep 60-yard pass, but he won't have this offense firing in all cylinders through all 60 minutes of the game. I think it's going to be an ugly, low-scoring game, and I got the Badgers 20-13. to 13. All right, so if Graham Mertz plays, I like Wisconsin 45-21. to 21. I'm going to give you two different predictions. If Graham Mertz doesn't play, I like Wisconsin mm, – yeah. 21 to 17. I think it's going to be uglier than that 21 to 17 score lets on, but uh, mm-hmm. it was the Michigan defense is so bad. They are so bad. And I think this one guys, is going to remind me a lot of that Michigan Iowa game last year. Going to be low scoring, ugly, honestly hard to watch. Really the antithesis of this matchup last year. Uh, yeah. And Quinty Pay, I don't think will be playing for Michigan, kind of sounds like. So uh, that's another huge loss for them. And, uh, Aiden Hutchinson's the other guy out for Michigan on the defensive line. So there goes their two best defensive players. Uh, That's a huge loss. I I mean, those defensive backs are just not good enough to make up for the losses on the defensive line. Even with Danny Vandenboom at quarterback, that Wisconsin defense is going to eat Michigan alive. And the Wisconsin offense is going to do enough to get the win. But with Graham Mertz, this isn't even a contest. Not even close, no. Especially when you consider the four Michigan's been in this season. They're just not themselves. Yeah, and – I think we're unanimous here, though, or you, unanimous. I, I've been messing up so many times today with my voice. I don't know what it is, but uh, Wisconsin is the better team than Michigan. It's not even not even a competition this year. I agree. All right, so let's move into our final game, the Friday night matchup. Tonight, if you're listening to this, the minute we drop it, uh, we're just a handful of hours away. But Iowa and Minnesota, Golden Gophers, they get three Friday night games this season. They're lost to Maryland tonight's game, and their game against Purdue next week. All Friday night games. In fact, here's a fun, here's another fun stat I figured out. There's only one Big Ten East team that even gets to play a Friday night game, and that was Minnesota against Maryland. Why is the Big Ten West getting all the Friday night games? I don't know, but the Big Ten West kind of has a more Friday night game feel to it. Oh, totally. I mean, the East, the East just has – Better teams, I think. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. And going into the season, we didn't know really. Uh, bigger brands, certainly. Uh, and better teams yeah. this year. And, yeah. But, you know, I was saying the East has better teams. So that's why. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. But I, the brands are bigger. But mm-hmm. the teams this year, you know, Michigan and Penn State are shaky. Yeah. But I mean, you, you still want to look at Maryland and Rutgers who are on the rise. I mean, it, it's a, I would say it's an overall stronger division. But, I agree. It depends on how you look at it. Uh, there's multiple perspectives you can have on there. Right. Um, but going into the season, the people making these schedules thought, well, we're going to have four really good teams in the East, Ohio State, Penn State, uh, Michigan, and Indiana. And they're like, well, let's put those games on Saturday. They're going to get better viewership. So uh, that probably has to do with it. But this game, this Iowa-Minnesota game, I call this one the disappointment bowl because I was expecting a lot from both of these teams going into the year, and they have let me down. So it's, it's a hard game to pick because, like I said, both these teams, we had expectations for them. They haven't lived up to them. But going into this game, Minnesota's offense, you would think that's, gonna, that's what's going to win it for them if they do come away with a win. But I think they're going to be ineffective this game because the passing game is easy to lock down. You just double-team Rashad Bateman. Tanner Morgan's not really going to find a way to get too much done on – a regular basis. Muhammad Ibrahim, he is the entire Minnesota offense, and he's the only way they've been able to move the ball and pick up points um, through the first three weeks. It's the only way to do it. It's on the ground. Um, but now they're going, they're going up against the 14th ranked run defense in the FBS who gives up two and a half yards per carry. Muhammad Ibrahim, he usually runs for about five, six, seven yards per carry. So they can limit him. They're going to limit this entire Minnesota offense, it seems. So I think Ibrahim is still going to be a major factor in this game. He's still going to get decent yards, but he's not going to be putting up regular Ibrahim numbers. So he, 
um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, like I said, Ibrahim, not going to put up uh, video game numbers like we've seen in the past, but uh, he'll still be a factor. I just don't think he has enough um, to put Minnesota over the line. And while Iowa and Spencer Petras haven't looked tremendous, both overall and on offense, they're taking on a, a weaker Gophers defensive unit that will allow them to succeed. I want Spencer Petras to have the game of his life so badly, but I don't think it happens. Either way, I still think Iowa gets it on offense because they have one of my favorite running back duos in the Big Ten, which is Goodson and, and Sargent. I think they score a respected amount of points. I think they get, I think they win this game 35 to 24. Uh, Minnesota still be able to move the ball a little bit here and there, but you can't just rely on one guy to run the ball again for you against Iowa. It's just not, not how you win games. I like Iowa 20 to 14. And I'm sorry if you can hear my sweet mate, my idiot sweet mate bumping uh, the new future and Lil Uzi Vert collab. Uh, but he is. And I'm sorry if you can hear that. It's annoying me just as much as it's probably annoying you if you can hear it. Hopefully you can't though. Uh, anyway, Iowa, even in Minnesota's best season, maybe of all time, owns them. Minnesota has a jinx against Iowa, the same way Nebraska does against Wisconsin. They just can't seem to beat them uh, for the life of them. And even if I think uh, Minnesota, Reed says he can't hear it. Okay, I just got a text from Reed. He cannot hear the music. Uh, I can't, though, and it's annoying me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think Iowa just owns Minnesota. Uh, it's Kinnick North for a reason. That's what they call it. TCF Bank Stadium's Kinnick North. Iowa's winning. Simple as that. Final score prediction? 20 to 14. Tyler Goodson plays well. Ibrahim plays better, but Minnesota's defense just can't contain him. I like that pick. Yeah, this will be – on one end, you could say it's a hard game to watch because the defense is um, – or really the Minnesota defense is going to look bad, but I think it will be a relatively high-scoring one. So good could be some good Friday night action for you. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a fun one, uh, hopefully. Uh, not a fun one if you're a Minnesota fan or an Iowa fan because I think this one could get kind of ugly and chippy real quick. It always tends to between these teams. But I'll tell you, if I was an Iowa or Minnesota fan, I would be pretty nervous going into this game because uh, both teams need this win. And I think both of them, no matter who wins, they're both going to look rough and they're both all their fans are going to be the edge of their seats. Um, it's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of mistakes in this game and it's going to be hard to watch as a fan of either of these teams. Absolutely. I would be on the edge of my seat the whole game. I, I don't know if I could contain myself because, you know, this is, this is always a hotly contested game. And I think this is a frustrating one. It could be a frustrating one and it could be a season decider. I think that it's got a little bit of that, that vibe, like uh, this is where your season goes either up or down from here. And uh, I think the loser goes down. Yeah. I, I apologize. I think I might've misspoke and said Minnesota was winless a second ago. Minnesota is one and two, but regardless, still um, horribly disappointing when you, compare that to their last season, the season they had last year, getting an Outback Bowl win against Auburn, among other things. But yeah, should be a frustrating game as a fan of either of these teams, but as a neutral observer, might be a fun one to check out. Absolutely. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening to the First and Dead podcast. We'll see you next time. For Reed, I'm Patrick. Have a good one. Bye.